Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presented by the Research and Training Center for Pathways to Positive Futures. We're going to be talking about what works and what doesn't work for building skills and competencies in the mental health workforce. This is Janet Walker speaking. I'll be the first presenter today. As you can see on the slide, I am the director of the Pathways RTC, as well as a research professor here at Portland State University. I'll be joined shortly by Caitlin Baird, who is a trainer and a project manager here, and who has also worked as a peer support specialist for youth and young adults and as a supervisor of peer support specialists. The first part of this presentation will be a review of research literature related to best practices for building skills and competencies in the mental health workforce. The Pathways Research and Training Center focuses on improving outcomes for older youth and young adults, so we'll draw on some examples from that work. But most of what we'll be talking about today is true regardless of what population you may be working with, and aims to answer some tough and enduring questions like, why is training for skill building in the mental health workforce so often ineffective? If we know what kind of training actually works to build skills, why don't we do that more? And what are some emerging strategies for delivering effective training at reasonable cost? As part of answering that last question, Caitlin and I are going to talk about some training projects that we have going on at the Pathways RTC. I'll also be talking a little bit about a pet project I have, a kind of experimental training project that I have going on in my non-professional life. Those of you who have seen me present before know that I often bring my family into the picture and highlight some of the goofy stuff that goes on at our house. After recently becoming an empty nester, that only leaves one person at home that I can draw on for presentations. And that is our dog Jarvis, who features in the training project that I was talking about. We call it the Get Swifty Project, and you'll see why in a minute. The inspiration for the Get Swifty Project came from this video about Chaser, who is a remarkable dog. You'll see here that even Neil deGrasse Tyson is way impressed. Look what happens when Chaser is asked to bring her toys by name. Chaser? Find Inky. <laughs> well, she got one right. <laughs> Find Seal. Whoa! <laughs> and that one too. In fact, she got all nine right. Not only does Chaser know these nine toys, she actually knows more than a thousand. Chaser has been called the Einstein of dogs. So here we have Jarvis, who has never been referred to as the Einstein of dogs. In fact, despite the mortar board, we have not seen a ton of evidence that Jarvis has any exceptional intelligence whatsoever. On the contrary, there are things that he does that make us think the opposite. For example, his habit of making sudden, unprovoked attacks on the biggest dogs at the dog park. But to be fair, Jarvis does have his strengths. He is highly motivated to be top dog. And once he sinks his teeth into things, he does not let go. The hypothesis that we're going to test with the training project is whether we can help Jarvis to become more Einstein-like if we use the right training approach. So in other words, if we use principles of best practice for skill building, can we teach Jarvis to fetch his toys like Chaser? Here's Jarvis with his favorite toy, Swifty, which explains the title or the subtitle of the webinar. And he got Swifty for Christmas a couple of years ago. Here's a picture of Swifty now after participating in the intensive training project with Jarvis. So Jarvis uh, has a total of three toys. We already saw Swifty. Uh, in addition, Jarvis has the very creatively named Rope Bone and the even more creatively named toy called Ball. Now, Jarvis also used to have a toy uh, that he loved very much called Moly, another creative name. Uh, but unfortunately, Moly expired under suspicious circumstances. So the upshot is the training is somewhat easier for Jarvis. He only has to learn to bring one of his three toys when asked by name. So here is a little video showing Jarvis in pre-training. This demonstrates his level of pre-existing skill as well as his motivation to engage in the activity. Jarvis, go get the ball. Go get it. Go. Go on. So 
maybe Jarvis is not so different as far as existing skill and motivation for his task, as is the case for us when we are told we need to begin a new training. So let's check back in later to see how Jarvis's training goes when we use the best practices. Our presentation today is really just hitting a few of the highlights on this topic. As part of our work for our State of the Science Conference earlier this year, our staff prepared a series of briefing papers that go into detail on topics related to our research. One of those is on the same topic as this webinar. The paper goes into much more detail and provides citations for the claims that I'll be making today. So if you're suspicious about anything I say or just curious to learn more about the topic, I encourage you to take a look. If you want to get to that paper, just type Pathways RTC into your search engine and then you can navigate over to State of the Science 2018. So today's topics, again, here's our list. We're going to start with the first one, which is what new sorts of new knowledge and skills are important for working with older youth and young adults. Now, that is the topic, in fact, the only topic that's specific to youth and young adults. When we move into the remainder of the topics, there'll be things that are equally applicable regardless of the population or the approach that you use in your work. A little bit of the background for youth and young adults. There's actually very little evidence of uh, effectiveness for interventions that are specific to this age group. And that's been true up until very recently. What we do know is that typical services, regardless of whether they're delivered by the child system or the adult system, don't seem to really be engaging or developmentally optimal. And how we know that is that despite this age group, the older youth and young adult age group, having the highest rates of need for mental health services and uh, having the highest rates of mental health challenges, they're also the age group that is the least likely to engage in mental health services and the most likely to drop out prematurely. So over the last decade or so, there's been a sort of growing response from the field to develop new approaches and to test them or to give them what we call empirical support. And there's also been efforts to take existing evidence-based practices, so those that already have some evidence in the child world or in the adult world, and to adapt them so that they'll be more attractive and more effective for the older youth and young adult population. So when we look at the uh, interventions and programs that are supported by some level of evidence or by expert consensus, we find that there actually is a lot of shared elements across these new or adapted approaches. So for example, what we see is things like that the approach must be driven by the perspectives of the young person, um, their goals uh, and their ideas about what will work or what won't work. They also are focused on building skills, including specifically skills for self-determination, which is the ability to make and carry out plans focused on goals that are important to the young person. But also on skills for uh, connecting to and functioning in what we call supportive contexts, or people who are supportive of the young person's positive development, or kind of places or organizations that are supportive. So that could be a workplace, it could be a club, it could be a set of peers, it could be a, a university or something like that. And then the other shared feature is that the practice should in, incorporate a strengths perspective. And what we see is that an argument across these different approaches that once these principles are incorporated into practice, there is a result of increased engagement, good working relationships, and the activation of change processes. So in the last slide, we saw about these common elements across empirically supported approaches for improving outcomes with older youth and young adults. I want to take a moment to emphasize the importance of having a structured approach. So these are key features and shared features are expressed often as principles, but principles, these sort of abstract um, ways of stating things, say that you should do things in a youth and young adult driven way or be strengths based, those kind of principles are simply not enough to produce 
good practice, effective practice, or effective practice that leads to outcomes. So what we need in addition to the principles is some set of structures uh, and guidance that is much more specific about what a provider is supposed to do as he or she interacts with a young person. And this has been shown to be true across interventions, including ex specifically work with older youth and young adults. In contrast, what we know very clearly from quite a bit of research is that unstructured or eclectic approaches are very unlikely to be effective. In fact, eclectic practice in usual community mental health care has close to no effect at all. So it's important that we translate these principles into actual practice um, with specific guidelines for what that practice is supposed to look like. Now, why is it that unstructured or eclectic practice is so ineffective? Well, basically what it turns out is that a lot of the time is spent in doing or in conversations that don't really incorporate any elements of evidence-based or best practices. They're not, there's no focus to it particularly. And what is more, there are large proportions of the time that are spent in chit-chat or what one of my colleagues calls idle chit-chat, um, but it, what is talked about in the literature as chat. And what that means is it's not connected to any active ingredient of treatment. Um, and it also, the, the higher the percentage of chat in a session, the lower level of engagement that a client is likely to feel. And I think that that's in some ways runs counter to what a lot of providers believe, that if they kind of get down to business with their clients, clients aren't going to like that. Now, admittedly, there needs to be a balance. You can't just jump in if you don't have a sense of rapport. But I do think that sometimes providers feel that that sort of chit-chat will lead to rapport, whereas I think that more generally there are actually much more strategic and motivational approaches that lead to rapport more effectively and don't fall into this chit-chat sort of trap. So now that we have talked about the fact that there are some structured approaches or any structured approach that, that may have been developed um, and there's some evidence for effectiveness, then the challenge obviously is to implement that program more widely so that more people will have the benefit of receiving treatment uh, from a structured and effective approach. And that, of course, then raises the need for cost-effective training so that there is a workforce uh, who can do these practices. So what does it take to get people to do a new practice? Well, not surprisingly, people learn best when they're motivated. And also, not surprisingly, we all are aware that external motivation or extrinsic motivation can work. Uh, and that can be a pay raise or a biscuit or a good um, job evaluation, etc. We also know that praise itself can be quite motivating. But it turns out that actually intrinsic or motivation from inside the person is much more powerful and enduring as a source of motivation for people. People actually generally love learning. And there's quite a bit of very interesting research that looks at people's emotions across the course of their day. And it turns out that the times that they are reliably in the best mood and have the highest sense of well-being is when they are confronting a challenge that is pushing them to the edge of their existing competence. So it's something that is challenging, but not too hard. So it's not too easy. It's not too hard. It's focused on, it's an individualized to their level of existing competence. So it's kind of like Goldilocks, not too easy, not too hard. But training is also going to feel rewarding. We're thinking about in the workplace setting now when they see that it's going to help them do their jobs better and particularly when it helps them to, to solve problems that they encounter on the job. So training needs to be designed so that it feels relevant and so that people have a sense that the trainers are credible, that they really know what they're talking about. So it's not just people who've been successful in implementing the service, but a good strategy is also to have people who have experienced service as part of the training process. So we know that this is true in human services contracts. People who feel that they are being supported by training and coaching to do their jobs better are more satisfied with their work and less likely to leave their jobs. So here we see people and a dog being very gratified by being motivated. 
Uh, and of course, intrinsic motivation also revolves around um, being people being motivated to use their strengths and their skills. So now, let's look at another little video of Jarvis. And this was in the early stages of the Swifty training project. And here was an effort to increase Jarvis's motivation in the training by giving him a task that's somewhat challenging, but not too challenging, and by engaging his strengths, in this case, his desire to be top dog, and making training fun. Go get Robone. Get Robone. Go on. Bring it here. Jarvis, get Robone. Grrr. Grrr. Ah, okay. So let's assume we have workers who are actually motivated to learn new practices. This brings us to what is really the crux of what we're talking about today. What does it actually take to ensure that they can do these new practices or to produce practice change in real world settings? In other words, what does it take to ensure that providers have the skills that they need to interact with clients in specific ways prescribed by empirically supported approaches? So what we might normally start out with is exposing them to some new information. We we'll tell them about the new practice and even tell them how it works, describe it all in a great deal of detail. Well, unfortunately, as you can see uh, from the distance from the box up to the blue bar, which represents actual practice change, exposure to new information can increase knowledge about a new practice, can produce favorable attitudes about the practice and some motivational stuff, pretty much leads to zero impact on actual practice when you send out, if you send people out to do the new practice, they wouldn't be able to do it. And maybe that makes sense. So what can we add in to help ensure uh, practice change? So the next thing that often happens is uh, some practice with feedback. And this we're talking about um, basically role play or behavioral rehearsal that they can, it teaches people how to demonstrate the skill in a controlled setting, like within a workshop or among their colleagues uh, to do scenarios, et cetera. Um, and this is also very helpful because it helps people be able to get a sense of what the skill is. But as far as producing practice change in those kind of unpredictable, difficult real world settings, still very far from being able to reliably get people <clears throat> to undertake new practices. So what does it actually take to get people up to the blue bar here? Well, again, a lot, a lot of research on this. I encourage you to look at our paper if you would like to see the details, but there's pretty much no question that what it takes is uh, high quality coaching following up. So you've taught people how to do it. You've let them practice behavioral rehearsal. What it takes on that is some ongoing coaching and the characteristics of ongoing coaching, high quality coaching include, first of all, some kind of observation by an expert. An observation can be live with the expert coming to watch, watching through a mirror, et cetera, or it can be video or audio, even audio recording based where the expert is watching or listening to um, the practice, but not at the same time as the practice is actually happening. But in addition to that, from the observation, there needs to be feedback to the person who's learning, to the trainee from the expert, and that feedback must be reliable and objective. And what that means is, suppose we had three experts on the new practice change. When we say reliable, what we mean is that all three of those experts on watching, say, a video recording of a person doing the practice would provide essentially the same feedback. Um, because that means that they're actually training people, again, to some sort of structure, some sort of set of reliable expectations. So, um, again, feedback needs to be reliable, objective. It needs to be based on some kind of rubric or scoring scheme or rating scheme, whatever it's, it may be. And then there needs to be, there need to be cycles of observation and feedback so that people have a chance to practice and improve. And that has to happen over time because people aren't just going to automatically get to be great. So, um, that has to typically happen over at least a period of several months. And it ends when a person, the trainee, can demonstrate that they've actually achieved a level, a benchmark level of practice uh, quality. So when we look at um, some of the research summaries on training, these are the kind of things that we tend to see. And I'm just going to read these because it's it's really important to emphasize. So one of these uh, meta-analyses concluded with this statement, training alone 
did not result in practitioner behavior change, we recommend that training no longer be used as a standalone implementation strategy. So what they mean is training without that ongoing coaching doesn't work. Here we have another piece. Workshops and manuals are insufficient in producing significant change in provider skills or clients' outcomes. Basically, another quote kind of getting at the same uh, idea. Uh, and just a little kind of detour into why is it that observation is so important? Um, you know, I think that a rather huge majority of the time uh, in mental health field, we rely on uh, learners, so that could be people who are getting supervised or trained, we rely on their reports of how they're working with clients as the basis for uh, offering suggestions about practice improvement. And I think that part of the reason why this kind of approach is not effective is, um, is the evidence comes from this um, set of findings that originated in a paper called Unskilled and Unaware, uh, and it's a, such a famous study. There have literally been thousands of follow-ups to this, uh, showing the uh, robustness of this effect, that it has its own name based on the authors of the original paper. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And what it means is that people are generally extremely inaccurate reporters on their own skill, and that, in fact, their inaccuracy itself is sort of systematic in that people who are worse at something tend to rate themselves as better, whereas people who are better at something tend to rate themselves as worse. And it's really actually not surprising um, when you think that when you are a novice at something, you don't really know what it takes to do it well, and you don't have that nuance and understanding, and that, that as you start to gain skill, you definitely get more of an understanding about what the complications and the difficulties are. So uh, again, this is a extremely robust and 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 very important finding. So this leads us to our next test, uh, showing Jarvis a little farther along, and uh, showing what happens when we have direct observation of Jarvis's practice, a reliable scoring system, so does he bring back the right thing or not, and then we have uh, data coaching, so we're respond we're able to coach based on the data. So let's watch the video. Jarvis, get your fifty. Go get your fifty. Go on. Hurry up. Go get your fifty. <laughs> okay. So here we see that Jarvis was not successful. And additionally, we would not want to have Jarvis be the one reporting on his success in the task as he is very pleased with himself and certainly acting like he's done everything right. So this leads us to our third question today, which is why aren't these optimal approaches implemented more widely already? Well, perhaps not surprisingly to anyone, the main uh, barrier to implementing high quality training and coaching comes down to cost. And that's not just paying for the training and coaching itself, but covering people's times, the cost to travel to training, and so on. Uh, it becomes extremely expensive. Um, and then, of course, if you have staff turnover, you lose that investment and you have to start all over with the time and the expense and, and all of that. And we know, uh, unfortunately, in our field that uh, turnover in direct services and mental health averages 25 to 30 percent, with 30 percent being the more frequently cited figures figure. So, um, it's also worth contemplating experience with evidence-based practices since the evidence-based practice implementation typically includes um, those elements of training best practices. Um, so they typically have that observation, training and coaching uh, to criteria, et cetera. So um, within evidence-based practice, um, maybe not surprisingly, the cost of evidence-based of implementation is seen as the top 
uh, barrier. And I think that this has become more and more important uh, as the evidence-based practices movement has in, uh, matured in recent years. And there's been uh, more in the way of study of these kind of costs, both initial and ongoing costs. And there was a 2014 study found that cost was the top reason for discontin discontinuation of evidence-based practices, and that fewer than half of community agencies that started an evidence-based practice was still going with that at six years. So not only is that kind of sad because the evidence-based practice didn't really take, but if you think of all of that initial uh, investment, that might be a lot of cost kind of going down the drain. So here I want to look at two studies of an evidence-based practice, um, uh, uh, trauma-focused CBT. And um, we know that the cost of implementation, a huge amount of it, is related to the training and coaching costs. So we look at um, the cost per child treated, um, and this is just to, to show you, these are across uh, two studies, that we have $2,700 uh, cost per child treated over uh, the course of, I think this was four or five years. And that was in the initial in the initial year, so the first year of, of obviously there's going to be higher cost. But what might be even more surprising is that in subsequent years, the costs were averaging still almost $2,000 per child treated. And again, that sort of, that sort of uh, reminds us that you have an evidence-based practice that's only going to uh, apply to a small number of the people who might be on a given clinician's caseload. So let's look at the cost per, per clinician trained. Again, uh, in the initial year, um, Eleven thousand six hundred some odd dollars, but then ongoing on close to forty five hundred dollars per year. And then, if we look at the the cost at the agency level, uh, close to ninety thousand dollars in the first year, and sixty five thousand dollars for ongoing years. So really, it's not any surprise uh, that um, evidence based practices are often. Um, discontinued that this is just an example, but again, we saw previously that cost was always very important to agencies and that, um, you know, uh, again, is sort of highlighting the fact that if you want to serve a diversity of clients, then that sort of implies that if you want to do a good job with that, you have to have multiple evidence-based practices available from your agency. So we look at a total cost that's actually much higher than this. So, that is kind of the bad news, I guess. So here's uh, what I want to focus on as kind of what the good news might be, is what are some strategies for addressing uh, challenges and barriers, including importantly the cost issues that keep agencies from being able to implement high quality training with their staff. And in order to do this, we're going to focus on a series of projects that we're doing here at uh, Research and Training Center, which is our effort to uh, create training that is at on par with the cost of sort of a week of workshoppy type training, but not only provides that initial instruction and all that, but actually also provides coaching uh, with reliable feedback over a period of time. And the way that we're able to do that and keep it at a reasonable cost is by doing all of it online using our online training platform called the Virtual Coaching Platform. And the way that we're able to make it cost effective is by using a web-based platform, we're able to eliminate costs that are uh, related to travel, and that's travel for the trainers to go there. It's also travels for the trainees to come to some central location to stay in hotels and, and participate in a training for four or five days. Um, we are also able to provide training and coaching that is at the level of a trainee's skill, so it's very individualized. Um, and that, as we saw earlier, also uh, supports motivation. Um, and that we have additional training and boosters that are targeted to areas of need. So if somebody doesn't master a certain skill or, or um, a process, they're able to get further training. Additionally, large portions of the training are self-paced so that uh, they can be carried out during unstructured or downtime. So say you have a cancellation, you can go onto the website uh, 
and watch, say we have assigned some homework that says watch some examples of real life people providing uh, this intervention to clients. Another aspect of our Achieve My Plan projects is that we're actually trying to build um, cost effectiveness in it, into our work by um, making this what we call a practice enhancement. So it's focused on those key elements and principles that we talked about at the beginning, how to do better youth-driven practice, which actually turns out to be quite challenging for people, um, how to teach self-determination skills and ensure that young people have a chance to really learn those, which for them, just like your trainees at your at your agency involves going out and practicing, getting some feedback and, and cycles of learning. Um, so what AMP teaches a structured approach for, in, for promoting these skills and a series of defined techniques so that providers can do this series of things. Facilitate a strengths-based, person-driven process that is truly driven by youth and young adult perspectives. Again, this is something I feel like uh, people are generally expected to be able to do, but is actually much more difficult. Um, in practice than in theory. Uh, it also helps providers learn how to model, teach, and support youth and young adults so that they can practice self-determination skills in real life settings and support youth and young adults to connect to positive people and contexts in their communities. And so what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Caitlin, who has been one of the lead trainers for our AMP projects, and she's going to talk a little bit more about what AMP, which stands for Achieve My Plan, what that series of projects uh, actually uh, entails and what the training is like. Thank you, Janet. So before we get into the AMP training process, we'll talk about why bother. So why did we decide that it was valuable to create such a curriculum and intervention for providers to use with their young people? Firstly, youth often feel unheard and unsatisfied with their services. We often see that youth, particularly older youth and young adults, become disengaged with services because they feel like uh, that no matter what they want, it doesn't come to fruition, or that their providers don't hold that as a priority. This isn't true for every single young person, but we know that it's true for many of them, particularly young people who are often the, of the highest need. We also see a need for a culture shift. Services as usual typically focus on telling young people what they need to do, what programs they need to complete, and how they need to do them in order to become successful. This doesn't work. Not only does it prevent young people from taking action and making decisions about their own lives, thus hindering their ability to develop self-determination skills, but often it leads to young people's disengagement. We understand that this isn't something that is done and because people like to be mean or lecture young people. It's simply done out of the youth's best interests and their safety. What we believe is that young people also have their best interests at heart, are their own best experts, and can be guardians of their own safety as long as we help provide some guidance and flexibility so that they can make decisions for themselves. And lastly, the best way to produce change is through guided practice. In order to create real meaningful change, it's important that people not only get to practice some techniques, but they get specific feedback and coaching related to such. So what does the AMP training entail? Firstly, we have monthly video conferences that cover young adult engagement techniques. This includes things like open-ended questions, reflections, descriptive praise, and how to keep things conversational. We also have specific AMP curriculum modules. These modules focus on modeling, teaching and practicing self-determination skills in the community, as well as uh, decision-making and uh, goal setting. We'll talk a little bit more about these modules in the next slides. We also focus on the theory of change related to AMP, and we focus on advanced skills, such as supporting a young person to make a decision, opening a topic, and what to do when things don't go as planned. Before we get into the modules, we'll talk a little bit about the guiding philosophy of AMP, which is called Guiding Without Leading, or GWAL. All of the engagement techniques that we teach providers within the AMP intervention is based in this foundational concept, Guiding Without Leading. Guiding Without Leading is a very delicate balancing act. It asks that the provider provide some structure 
so that the young person can practice self-determination skills, such as decision-making, identifying support, or let's find out, but not suggesting what the young person should do or telling them what to do. In order to provide this structure, we train providers on how to use very specific youth engagement techniques that help young people brainstorm and generate ideas, as well as provide some guidance for providers to offer their input when necessary, but again, without telling the young person what to do or making specific decisions for the young person. Providers are expected to use guiding without leading and these specific conversational techniques throughout the AMP modules. You can see the names of our AMP modules listed at the top of this slide, which include vision to activity, planning for a meeting, meeting or activity, and then at the very bottom, we also have our booster check-in. You can also see the different self-determination skills that young people focus on as they go through the AMP modules. Each AMP module focuses on some specific self-determination skills. That said, any self-determination skill can be utilized within any module of AMP. Here, you can see that we have the AMP modules listed again, and this is the process that we hope AMP looks like. As you can see, it's never ending. AMP is not a one-time intervention. It's not meant to be a single dose or single serving. It's supposed to be a cyclical intervention that providers use with their young people on an ongoing basis as they are a part of a team planning process. AMP, it's important to remember, is very adaptable. So any of these modules can be changed depending on the needs of the youth. Additionally, we expect that each of these modules, quote unquote, are going to look different each time you do them with a young person. For instance, during the vision to activity module, we ask that young people identify a goal and narrow down some action steps related to that goal that they wanna work on. As they complete those action steps, thus achieving their goal, the next time they do the vision to activity, a new goal will be focused on, and so on and so forth. Now let's talk a little bit about what the training process looks like. There are a few steps to the training process that coaches and providers go through together. Number one, we have review. This is where the AMP trainers review a piece of the curriculum with the trainees during a video conference. They get some knowledge about what it is they are supposed to focus on. Next, we have observe. Trainees get to log into what we call our virtual coaching platform, and they view an AMP coach, use skilled practice with a young person as they are going through the AMP module. Next, we have practice. This is where the trainees record themselves working with a practice person or a young person conducting the AMP module using the AMP conversational techniques. Then we have feedback. This is where an AMP trainer reviews that, that practice that the trainee has submitted to our virtual coaching platform and provides specific guided feedback on the techniques that the trainee is or is not using and how they relate to the greater AMP themes. This process is repeated until specific benchmarks are met. Finally, we have repeat. This process continues through all of the curriculum modules. Trainees get to practice, record, and get feedback for each module with a practice person and a young adult in their caseload. This process is repeated until specific benchmarks are met, and then finally trainees can graduate the AMP process with certification. You heard me talk a little bit about our virtual coaching platform during the last slide. The virtual coaching platform is an online module that we use so that folks can participate in the training remotely, uh, we also think that it is a really great platform in order to provide really specific feedback. So the virtual coaching platform, or VCP, as I'll call it from here on out, does things like allows users to submit video of their actual practice for trainers to review. Trainers can then go in and observe that practice minute by minute and provide direct feedback regarding specific techniques. Trainers generate feedback reports uh, that trainees can use, and they also create clips of strengths and improvables for users to view. So trainees actually have the opportunity to view their own practice and look at some of the things that they are doing well, as well as some of the things that they need to improve upon from the AMP trainer's perspective. 
The trainer also provides specific coaching related to strengths and improvables based off of the clips that they generate, as well as the feedback reports. Here's a screenshot of a BCP. So as you can see, we have a video that can be uh, viewed, and we also code for the specific parameters that you see over on the right-hand side, things like youth-driven, strengths, positive connections to people and community, expanding skills and promoting discovery, so on and so forth. This is a screenshot of the feedback report that users receive after their video is coded in BCP. So as you can see, we have everything divided up by the segment and parameter, and then the coach's specific comments on feedback. The clips that they create can also be embedded into this feedback report. Now, I'm going to turn it back over to Janet to talk a little bit about our evaluation. So, of course, because we're researchers, we want to make sure that our training approach is actually effective. Uh, we did incorporate what we our version of the um, elements of effective training and coaching, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we saw the results that we wanted. So we currently have a paper. It's in press now, and if you're listening to this recording, uh, this a recording of this webinar. Um, it may indeed be available on our website, so I encourage you to go over there and see. And if not, you can sign up for our updates and we'll let you know when it's ready. Um, but essentially, we had 61 participants in our online training and basically showed that the training approach was quite effective. So we have pre and post provider skills. So we, com we were able to uh, compare their skill level at the beginning of the training and after the training, and we saw that their skills increased significantly. And those were in each of the areas that we mentioned before. So their ability to be youth and young adult driven, to do strengths-based practice, to teach self-determination skills, and to connect young people to positive contexts in the community. And this was assessed in two ways. First of all, by providers' own ratings of their confidence in their ability to work with young people successfully to, uh, in each of these four ways, um, so their confidence or self-efficacy, but also because we're doing um, video-based um, coaching, we were able to compare the ratings using our reliable scoring system uh, from their early videos to their final videos. Um, and again, if you want to read all about it, you can do this on the website. There are uh, several um, different ways to read about it. Um, but uh, the people were also quite satisfied and uh, with the training, their ratings of the training of importance, uh, the credibility of the trainers, uh, the training organization, and the impact on their practice average about 8.7 out of a scale of 10, so quite high, really. And again, as you can see, there is the article in press um, reporting on this in more detail. And in fact, actually, at this point, there's also a webinar existing on uh, the Pathways Research and Training website, website that was done, uh, I think it was in November, that goes over the details of this study um, in, at, in, at length. So you can actually see that as well. What we have been working on, again, is a family of Achieve My Plan approaches. So we ha are working, again, on this series of enhancement skills that we think uh, can be implemented across different types of uh, practices. So we have Achieve My Plan for Wraparound, and there we have a study showing um, that Achieve My Plan was successful in improving young people's engagement in wraparound, uh, as well as their alliance with the team. And again, for young people, alliance, working alliance with providers is one of the best predictors of outcomes. Uh, there's also a research project and a webinar on the Pathways uh, website about this. We have uh, AMPTF for transition facilitators. That was the population that we were using the study that I just described. Um, and we also have a study there is also a webinar on this on the website about AMP Plus, which was using those uh, basic skills um, to improve practice for uh, peer support providers for youth and young adults. And there was sort of an additional area of skill building, which was this emphasis on peer support or peerness, or how to use your peerness uh, effectively um, with young people. And the training study for that also showed that peer support providers had increased skill as measured again both by their self-report and by our ratings of their videos as well as decreased job anxiety so they felt more confident and less anxious that they were doing a good job when they were at work.
So again, you can read, I think, uh, pretty much everything that I've talked about or a good portion of it is linked in some way to this AMP uh, Achieve My Plan um, mini website that we have uh, on the servers at Portland State University, so you can look at that. I really want to emphasize some of the interesting things that we learned as we tried to go to this 100% uh, online um, training approach, which personally I believe is the wave of the future, that this is the way that we will all be operating in the future. So let's let's just kind of dive into these a little bit more deeply. So ensuring that people and uh, complete all aspects of training. So we had training over a period of approximately mm, five months, really, with eight hour and a half webinars, eight video homework submissions, and eight feedback calls. Um, and I already spoke about how it might be difficult for um, people to encounter that level of support and also motivation from supervisors and managers. Um, but also the question was, the, there's the issue of high turnover rate and heavy caseloads. Um, and sometimes people left before they finished um, the training or the training was underway before they got started in the organization. These are all very uh, typical issues with training and coaching, but also true in our approach as well. Um, we found that some people were not able to manage their time, even with all of the appropriate kind of structures and motivations uh, applied in their agency. Um, they just couldn't seem to find the time to do it. Sometimes there were issues with technology, um, but usually these were minor and we could definitely work with those. There was a lot of apprehension about trying something new, not just about the practice itself, but about the idea of being recorded and uh, watched. Um, but again, to implement any kind of really high quality coaching, you have to get watched, you have to be observed. So um, there was also people who thought that young people, the youth that they worked with would not be happy uh, to have the providers being uh, recorded during the sessions. But in fact, the youth, once it was explained that the idea was improvement of the provider's practice, the youth were generally quite uh, unconcerned and very uh, willing to consent to that. And here's getting to that this last question about sustainability for organizations. That's very difficult for them to keep going. Um, in order to implement this high quality of coaching, it requires someone who really understands who uh, what the training entails, has the time to dedicate in order to provide that feedback, and also is a reliable coder, um, which is not hard for our staff because we do it all the time, but does turn out to be difficult for people to learn when they're doing, say, one training a year. Because what happens is then they, they forget in between and they have to struggle, uh, and so it becomes difficult. So we also find that organizations that want to have their own people do the coaching, uh, again, using our video platform, it's per certainly possible for people in the organizations to do that coaching. But often they just add that responsibility to someone who already has a full-time job. Um, and that seems to be a really a lack of recognition about what it takes to do the coaching um, that we're able to provide. And this leads uh, pretty typically to either burnout or diluted coaching training feedback where they're just not getting to it, they're not able to do it in, in the quality manner um, that we're able to do. Um, but we do think that uh, organizations maybe on a somewhat larger scale who invest in a staff member that's really dedicated to this work, so it's a, it's a substantial and ongoing part of their workload, would be likely to sustain this model and possibly save money. Um, we also think that in a sort of another way, again, keeping it cost effective, that our staff could, and we've worked on this with some of our training sites, our staff does the training and coaching, and then a lo the local coach does the feedback sessions with staff. Um, and so they are spared kind of the time-consuming aspect of coaching, of uh, coding the videos, but, and also they don't have to maintain absolute reliability that they're sort of given that support from our staff. Uh, again, um, you know, despite all of these challenges, we believe that being able to implement this gold standard of high quality training and coaching, it actually appears to be effective, that um, self ratings and video ratings of skills increase significantly, um, which is much more than can be said of a lot of training approaches, and also that people are very satisfied um, and that there is more, more role clarity for the workers. So here, we're going to look at what happened to Jarvis when he is given gold standard training over time. So 
Let's see what happens to Jarvis's success rate. Oh, look at there, it's going up, up, up. And now we have a video showing Jarvis uh, at the end of his training. Go get your Go on, go get your Jarvis, get your Come on. So yay, Jarvis was able to get Swifty. And for you, those of you who are fans of the original Swifty, there's a little homage. And I believe we have the thunder slide there. And thank you for joining us for this webinar.